Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Spokane City Council study session, first one of the year. And um, Council Member Stratton is not going to be joining us, and Council Member Zapone is going to be joining us a little bit later. So uh, we're going to start off with a brief interview with Bob Scarfo. Bob um, has been nominated by the mayor to serve on the Design Review Board. And um, Bob, you may or may not know this, but we like to interview people the first time they get appointed to a board and just find out a little bit about them and why they're interested. And you put some great language in your application that I reviewed. But if you could just take a few moments and introduce yourself to council and let us know uh, what you'll bring to the design review board and why you're interested. Oh, fantastic. Sure, sure. Uh, I, I started in landscape architecture back in 1966 at the University of Massachusetts. And um, it's interesting, uh, the thread, I'm becoming more and more aware of the thread that's been going through my life here. And, and I went back and did a master's degree in landscape architecture in the mid-70s. And I, can't, I honestly can't remember why, but I was... Uh, taken by the idea that the landscape could allow people with physical disabilities or disallow them from moving around their own community. Um, and so my master's thesis was on that, and I was part of a, a, the first committee in Massachusetts to turn the language into actually design criteria. Um, the years went by, and, and uh, in the last 20 years, I started back in 1998, actually looking at uh, how Spokane bec could become more age-friendly uh, and accommodate people uh, aging, and, and uh, uh, had my students looking at it, and uh, we did a couple a number of studies for downtown and for a couple other communities around the, the eastern part of the state. And then more recently, I've gotten uh, involved with uh, designing uh, inclusive communities uh, with people, people with autism uh, of all ages. And, and even more recently now, I'm trying to, do, uh, to, to get a handle on what we can do in terms of built environment for people living with dementia. And um, there's, there's a dynamite report out uh, two years ago on uh, designing for dementia in, in regards to the built environment. So it's been a tremendous help. And so um, I have the landscape architecture background, but I have a really deep concern. Uh, when I went back, I did a, a PhD in social geography. My concern has always been, um, as a designer, um, Am I going to leave people with a design they want to live with and they want to take care of? And I'd say that's probably the biggest thing I'll bring to the uh, the design review board. All right. Great. Great. Thank you. Councilmember Kinnear. Thank you. Uh, first of all, Mr. Scarfo, Karen Stratton says hello. She is very Disappointed she is missing this interview. I know you guys worked together at WSU for a while, and um, she greatly admires you. So sure, there's that. Uh, the other thing you mentioned, uh, and it, I think this is important, that you said that you want to design for the future, essentially, I'm paraphrasing. And I think that's what the design review uh, board is about, because this is not something that we're going to just have people review. They're going to approve something or not approve something, and we're going to live with it for a couple of years. These are lasting impacts, and they are things that it's not for us. It's for the people who are coming after us. Sure. Could you talk about that just a little bit more? Oh, sure. Uh, I think, and, and Garrett may remember uh, my saying this too, I would tell my classes that uh, I, I wasn't there to help them graduate. And, and, but I was there to help them stay ahead of the curve for the five, 10, and 15 years after graduation. That's, I don't know why that's always been my case. Um, you know, if, if I have a topic that I'm dealing with, I, I always immediately go to Google or some source and, and, and put the word trends in front of it uh, to try to understand where, what the state of thinking is regarding a particular topic, but in the years to come. 
Um, and you're, you're right on. You're right on with regard to uh, the future. Uh, an interesting thing that, that actually I'm writing about right now is that the American Society of Landscape Architects uh, code of ethics is business ethics, not end user ethics. And, and what I'm trying to do is make them a, a little more aware of the fact that maybe we should be a little more openly. Res- I, I know we are, and I know people. I know designers do. You know, they have, they come in with the best of intentions, but when it's not written in your professional society that we are responsible for the people who are left to live with a design, I think that there's a there's a hole there. Perfect, thank you. Uh, Council Member Bingle. Well, it's nice to meet you, sir. Yeah. And um, just wanted to ask a question. Um, I've done a lot of work with uh, groups that um, work with families that have been touched by autism, and you had even mentioned talking about designing for um, for autistic individuals. And uh, I'm curious to know uh, if you have some examples for us of ways that you would help shape design in the city to be more friendly to autistic individuals because we know that sensory triggers can um, can be pretty intense pretty quickly. And so I just didn't know if you had an example of ways that we can design to be more friendly, um, you know, to families touched by autism. A specific example, I'd, I'd, I'd have to think about it for a little bit, but there's there are a number of, there's a village um, that is designed specifically for people with autism in uh, one of the uh, Oh, I'm trying to think of it, Sweden or Finland. Um, but there, there are examples around the world of, of good examples, and then as a result, case studies that say this did work, that didn't work. Um, the thing that, that I've been involved with is uh, here in Spokane is Building Ohana, and uh, Deb Fink is the director, and we've done a couple of small workshops with people living with autism and, and their family members, um, and, and actually, this is what, uh, with regard to that and with regard to dementia, this is something that I really want to push, not as part of the design review board, but to really a- answer your question in a Spokane-specific manner. All right. Any other questions? Well, Bob, we're so excited that you applied for the Design Review Board and we'll know that you'll give us great service and insight. And really, this is the direction we're going is kind of as we densify the city of trying to uh, maintain des- uh, design standards and neighborhoods to keep them the same, even if there's more people there. And so you seem like a great person uh, to have uh, in that it. process. So great. So what will happen is... Uh, you don't need to do anything more. We will uh, vote on this, I believe, uh, Monday coming up. And uh, you don't need to be there for that. And we'll, you'll be notified that you're officially on the Design Review Board and you'll get to work. And I just uh, thank you in advance for your service. Fantastic. Thank you all. Yep. Yep. Great. Okay. So uh, we had a couple of time-sensitive um, ARP matters that the administration has asked us to consider. Uh, one is some fire pumper trucks, and the second is uh, the Dong Kardong bridge replacement. Um, so we're going to go to that next. We're going to start with the fire pumper trucks, and um, I think Chief Schaefer is going to take the lead on this and we're trying to figure out what the costs are, and there was some talk that if we approved it, by the 14th that uh, we would get some kind of significant discount and a little unclear about that. So, but go ahead. There is a white paper in your packet, but Chief Schaefer, if you want to go ahead and talk about what the plan uh, proposal is for these replacement trucks. Well, thank you, Council President. I'll introduce uh, Chief Atwood, our support services chief, to brief this matter for you. And actually, I'm going to let uh, Chief Stockdale speak to it. He's the SME and, and put together the briefing paper and, and is uh, intimate with the ordering process so he can speak uh, more clearly to the discounts and how all of that works. Great. Thank you, Jay. Uh, Council President and Council Member, since I don't have anybody else to pass this down to, I'll, I'll go ahead and brief you on it. Um, 
So you have the white paper in front of you. Um, and yes, the kind of the crux of the matter right now where we're asking for your support is that as of uh, 14 January, the annual price increase goes into effect on these trucks. And this year, it's about a 6% increase. So on the cost of this purchase, it's about a $200,000 increase. And we can save that if we can get this approved um, and the, the order placed uh, with Hughes Fire Equipment before the 14th of January. That's kind of the big uh, push for timeline. Mm -hmm. okay. Great. Do you have any other questions specific to the briefing paper that I can answer? I have a couple things, but first I'll open it up to other council members because I've been involved in this for a bit. Uh, council members, other questions about these four trucks? Council member Kinnear. Well, I know I'm the sponsor. Sorry, I'm the sponsor of this. Uh, we have had ongoing conversations about SIP loan versus um, public safety, or uh, yeah, not public safety levy, but the, um, what do I want to say, our property tax levy and back and forth on this. I kind of view this as a, not exactly emergency, but an emergency in terms of getting a, a better deal than if we wait. Let's just say that. Can you talk about that a little bit? Because I'm, I'm so reluctant to use a SIP loan for this sort of thing. And going forward, I, I know we had a council agreement that we were going to do things differently. So could you talk about that a little bit? Um, let me, let me ask a question of um, FIRE. <laughs> and again, I, I just saw an email exchange I, either yesterday or the day before about what what do we need to do on Monday? Is it sufficient to um, pass a resolution that says council is going to fund this purchase and then you guys uh, do the contract and we you know we don't pay that that's uh, my first question is what do we need to do in order to save the two hundred thousand dollars? So that's my first question. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, if, if we can get that approval on Monday and then. Uh, hopefully there's a requisition in the system already so that purchasing can generate the DO and the contracts and we can get all of that to use fire by the 14th, then we will save that price increase. Okay. That's correct. Okay. Um, so, Councilman uh, Member Kinnear, back to your question. Uh, if you recall, our plan is to try and replace these uh, pumpers, keep the new trucks in service on about a 12-year cycle as frontline trucks and then remove them to reserve status. Um, so out of our, our fleet of 14 pumpers right now, and if I'm throwing too many numbers at you, just tell me to stop, but uh, we currently have eight of them that are newer, which have been purchased since 2016. So slightly over half the fleet is new. Um, the trucks that are still frontline are 2009 models, and those should be moved to reserve status now. They're past you know, right around the 12 year mark right now. Um, and the average miles on those 2009 pumpers is about 130,000 miles. And if you recall, these are hard miles, you know, these trucks get started up and driven hard. It's not highway model miles. So we're, we're, we're pretty hard on them. The current reserve trucks, uh, have about an average mileage of, of 185,000 miles and they're 2001 vintage. So they're 20 years, 21 years old, and they, we really need to remove those from the service. So it's kind of a, a trickle down. If we can get the new trucks put into service, then the current frontline ones can be moved to reserve status on schedule. And although 20 years may not seem that old, unfortunately, we were at the point where some of the earlier iterations of the computer systems we're unable to upgrade and we've actually had to park one of the 2001 trucks outside in the yard and basically use it for parts because we're unable to get 20 year old computers to keep this truck running. So we're trying to stay ahead of the curve and get in a bad spot on replacement. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, a little bit uh, I just, for the new folks. Um, so pumper trucks are used when you don't have access to a fire hydrant. So, they would be used to fight wildland fires and that sort of thing. Is that correct? Uh, not quite. We, we typically do plumb into a, a hydrant for these structural engines. 
the pumpers, that they are strictly just a pump. They don't have any aerials on them like the okay. trucks. So okay. it's the brush trucks that we use out on a wildland fire. Sure. Okay, so are these trucks used at all um, in other jurisdictions, or are they strictly for our jurisdiction? Well, we have mutual aid with, with the surrounding uh, districts, so it's, it's definitely – it's primarily our resource, but it can certainly be used as a regional resource. Yes. Okay. I'm just trying to get a picture here of how, and I know they're heavily used. I know that they're not, you know, really clean free way miles that um, they, a lot of wear and tear. And I guess for the council, we've already talked about how to fund these or how we didn't want to fund them. And I don't know if that conversation needs to continue or we need to make an exception in this case. It, so, Council President. We are going to continue that. That's a good question. But before we get to that, I just want to clarify, um, Chief, th thanks for the update. So it sounds like of the 16, eight of them are since 2016, so we don't have to worry about that. The other, other eight are 2009. These four would replace four of those that would then go into reserves to uh, replace the 2001 reserves. So then we'd still, within the next few years, need to be looking at the other four 2009 replacements, essentially. Yes, sir, that's correct. Okay. We'd like to stay on an ongoing, just kind of every, you know, yep. on, a, on a regular basis, replace these trucks <clears throat> ahead of the curve. <clears throat> and then another, just kind of in the weeds question before we get to how to pay for it. Um, it, lo it looks like if we order them now, you know, it's still, it'll be over a year, you know, almost two years before we get them. Um, do we, but I see this 52,000 prepayment discount. So when would we actually have to pay the full price or is it a partial prepayment or how, how does that piece work? The, the discount for the partial uh, chassis prepayment would probably not occur till the end of 2022 at the okay. earliest. Okay. It's actually when they start building the trucks, okay. and they're so far backlog, it's like you said, a 16 to 20 months. Okay. So I don't, in the worst case, I don't expect seeing these trucks till October of 20, September, October 23, perhaps. Okay. Okay. So it's not really a cash flow issue. It's more of us just committing the funds. It's so that you Correct. Yeah, it's actually going to be money spent in 23, but committing $22, I guess. Okay. All right. All right. Yeah, now let me pivot to um, how to pay for them. So we talked about this at our um, ARP work group, which is uh, this year is myself, Council Member Wilkerson, and Council Member Zappone. And the question was, should we pay for this uh, with ARP funds, or should we... Uh, basically enter into a SIP loan uh, for this and spread out the payments over the years and then save the ARP funds for more community needs. And uh, I, Council Member Wilkerson is about to speak, but I think the consensus of the three of us was we should probably do the SIP loan, but I'll, I'll turn it over to Council Member Wilkerson because I think you're ready to. Thank you, Council President, and that's exactly where I was going with that. I know... Um, we had talked about the SIP loans and what we want to do differently. But in this case, there is another option to pay for these pumper trucks where with direct investment in our community, the ARPA funds is a one-time investment. So I would, I, I'm just challenged about using ARPA funding to pay for the pumper trucks instead of doing the SIP loan route. Yep. Yep. And I was also just going to mention, I, you know, we're starting our, first of the year planning and work plans for staff and I spoke with um, Matt Boston this week about things and one of the things that has been a, just a, a, a point of contention and some confusion is the public safety capital SIP loans and we had a plan that was in place and we were going on it and we eventually uh, stopped using SIP loans because we were going to increase year-over-year uh, -year funding by an additional $1 million from general funds every year with the property tax increase and a match. And so that's, that was the trajectory we we're on. And in um, the last two years, uh, we haven't made those um, um, million-dollar incremental increases, and so we've fallen behind on that. So I've asked Matt to work 
hopefully with uh, Tim Dunavant uh, to assist him, to really reformulate that whole SIP loan program. So this could be part of it, and since we don't have to pay the money until the end of 2022, uh, we could come up with that, if that's the um, council's wish. But it just we brought it to study session to find out, because we need to uh, quickly file a, a resolution that would authorize the uh, entering into the contract for the four pumpers, if that's what we choose to do. And it would be great in the resolution to have the funding source identified, even if we don't have all the details of how to do it worked out. Councilmember Kinnear. I, I, I see the logic of what you're talking about. I, I have heartburn over it, nevertheless. And um, I would like to um, have more information from Matt about what, how he sees this going forward, mm -hmm. because I, I support this, obviously, um, and if, if need be, we could use a SIP loan and then pay it back quicker. I mean, there's so, so I would like to know all the options that Matt could, the menu of options that Matt, oh, there's Chief Schaefer with his hand up, that Mr. <laughs> Mr. Boston could put forward for us to look at, and not it's not a question of not buying them, it's right. what are our uh, options of payment. So you're basically saying, which is totally also an option, do the resolution to enter into the contract and then defer uh, the payment choice for a bit until we get more details. Yeah. Yes, thank you for <laughs> Chief, making Chief my Schaefer. statement. Yeah. yeah, Chief Schaefer. Uh, Council members, Council President, I appreciate the dialogue. I, I think the, what I'm hearing or what I've been able to capture is the recognition of the importance of public safety capital and and really the details are how how that is going to be uh, worked into the budget i just wanted to pass along one one perspective and um i think i said this during budget preparation is everything that we did put forward in the 2021 i'm sorry 2022 budget uh was identified as critical we went through a exhaustive process within the department to identify needs that directly attributed to life safety, both of the employees and the public, and cut out any other area that, that simply was not uh, directly connected. Last year, we didn't uh, have an opportunity to buy any capital because of the, um, because of the missing SIP funds and uh, the plan uh, simply, simply did not get exercised so we're behind. So I just wanted to I just wanted to share that perspective. Um, I'm concerned if we don't move forward with at least the pumpers, but also with a number of other priority projects that are on our uh, on our budget that we proposed. And uh, when that when that um, decision is made, uh, we'll, we'll, we're certainly looking forward to the conversation. But when that decision is made for the capital. I'm just hoping that we'd be able to include everything that we propose for 22. Thanks. And I'm going to push back just a little bit. If I recall last year, we bought the, the brush trucks and we bought the pretty expensive rebreather equipment piece. So we did spend some um, serious capital money. And then the, the other thing is, and I don't have any reason to doubt as I sit here that everything you have on your list is um, critical, um, but I don't know that council was really involved in that prioritization process, and I think that's what we're trying on on capital budget items. What we're really trying to push for more is earlier uh, council collaboration before things get baked, um, so that we can be an enthusiastic 100% behind it, as opposed to uh, skeptical, which is kind of how it landed, I think, at at the. Uh, budget process last year so and it's not has nothing to do with fire it's across the board it's street reconstruction everything but just that capital budget for several years a council approval was kind of a formality and we weren't that engaged and so i think what we're pushing for is to be more engaged and really invite the community to be more engaged so that again when we move forward it is with enthusiasm and the backing of the community uh, so that you all can focus on on your work. So that's what I'm looking forward to um, is that we just 
spend a little time, as Councilmember Kinnear mentions, uh, going through these capital uh, expenditures across the board, not just in fire, also in police, um, and do that. But I, uh, several of us are in favor of um, purchasing these four pumpers and getting the $200,000 discount. But I want to open it up to any other council members if they want to comment on what I really want to hear mostly is whether you uh, support us putting a resolution together to, to authorize the contract uh, prior to the 14th. So if anyone's, or council member Cathcart. Yeah, I, I certainly am supportive of a resolution uh, to indicate that we want to move forward and, and get us that, that cost savings. A uh, little unsure on, on the funding side, where it should come from. I'm, I'm open to ideas. I mean, I'm open to ARP. I'm open to the possibility of a, of a SIP loan. I just kind of want to know, I think, a little bit more of the pros and cons between which direction. But, but certainly, I think we should move forward. Yeah, great. Councilmember Bingle. Yeah, I think that's most of what we just did with the last round of ARP dollars, right? Just assigning it to this thing will work out the exact, uh, uh, you know, measure of the funding coming up later. But um, like I think Councilmember Kinnear and Cathcart have both said, uh, you know, if it's good for the community, that's great. But just want to find the best way that we could take care of the taxpayer dollars. Yep, yep. Great. All right. Well, Chief, what I'm hearing from uh, everybody on this call, which is um, – uh, at least five of seven, is that we're supportive of a resolution. If you want to get your folks to get a resolution filed, uh, we would uh, consider suspending the rules on Monday. Uh, so it's whatever language you need to authorize entry into that contract. And then we'll figure out, we'll spend the rest, the uh, next few months, figuring out how we fund it. Um, but we are going to fund it, so uh, it sounds like. So is that... Is there anything else you need for the pumper trucks other than that plan? No, sir. We will move forward with um, the council um, legislative process for yeah. suspending the rules and moving forward with the purchase. Thank you very much for the consideration. Yeah. Well, and thanks for the information from all of you. And, and just to be clear, this study session counts as the uh, council touch prior to it. Uh, being considered on Monday, so you don't have to worry about it going on committee or anything like that. So, okay, all right. Uh, then we'll pivot from fire to parks, and uh, similarly, the ARP work group asked Garrett Jones to just present on the uh, Don Cardong Bridge replacement request. Uh, parks has made uh, a couple of capital requests, but we asked to just focus on this one in the ARP context today because it also has a time sensitivity and that we have to get it bridge replaced by the end of this year if otherwise we lose some other significant grant funding. And in order to accomplish that, we need to go out to bid shortly and, and get the contracts in place uh, prior to construction season. So with that, Garrett, um, and, and I know you've, I, I previously sent out um, uh, your written work product, and we've got uh, your memo just on Cardong and in the packet today. But go ahead and give us an overview, and we'll see what questions people have. Perfect. Thank you, uh, Council President and Council, uh, for this opportunity. And uh, welcome aboard, Council Member Bingle. Looking forward to working with you here in the future. Um, I will just share to just keep my thoughts. Um, all in line here, just a short presentation of what um, the ask is today with the Don Cardon Bridge. Um, so what this is, is, a, is an integral part and connection and link in the uh, regional Centennial Trail. Um, so to familiarize yourself, Don Cardon Bridge connects Gonzaga University to the WSU University. So that top picture on the right is the existing bridge, and then there's two renderings. Uh, below, one with the outlook that we're planning to move forward with, and then the bottom one just shows the scheme around updated lighting. Um, where we're at today uh, is what we call a high-risk and shovel-ready project. Um, I'll go in a little bit more detail of why it's shovel-ready and we're ready to go. 
And what we're looking for today, um, since this project has been deferred uh, because of the financial impacts of COVID and parks and recreation, of a total request of $1,450,000. The total estimate uh, project amount is slated for uh, a little over 2 million, 2.25. And right now we have $800,000 of grant funds um, in hand, which is, which is great news for us. A uh, big portion of that, 750 was through the Recreation and Conservation Office uh, administered by the state of Washington. I saw this as a high priority project. And then also the partnership with the Friends of the Centennial Trail, a nonprofit group. Uh, here in this region. Uh, the one piece though that we're running up against, uh, we did have to extend the grant uh, ask a couple times uh, because of the financial commitments in parks and recreation. And, and um, if we're not able to go under construction and complete this project in 2022, uh, we will lose that grant match that we have for the project. Um, so you can see uh, with that 800,000, what that local um, match is for us is that 1.45 with the uh, ARP ask the 1.45 as well. What we've done so far, and this is why it's shovel ready, is a numerous outreach meetings through stakeholders, neighborhoods, universities, university district uh, on the design and priorities of what we see, safety being a big one. Um, so then we went through the design process. We actually have the bid documents. We've gone through permitting. And then we have, of course, that grant um, secured. What we would like to do, um, if the council is acceptable of you know, us moving forward with this, is we're ready to go to bid this month um, to get it out to the contractors. Construction start this spring and then complete winter of 2022. Um, as you know, right now, what this renovation would include, this bridge, needs help. Um, it is, uh, half of it would be a, a diamond plate expanded metal slick surface. The other half is a wood plank um, that's not attaching to the joists underneath because we're uh, seeing a significant amount of dry rot. So we're seeing a lot of boards um, popping up on us. And we really need to preserve this now, uh, this critical uh, pathway. And the renovation would um, include the removal and placement of all bridge decking and we'd be replaced with a precast concrete decking, uh, which will be a lot easier to maintain for the city. Um, hazardous material abatement. So there's the existing railroad bridge does have lead paint. So we would be abating that and doing some minor structural work on that. Um, some minor concrete pier replacements, uh, redoing the bridge overlooks. As you know, today, there's a couple of them that are just permanently closed because structurally they're not sound. Um, to have any live or dead loads on those overlooks. They include new guardrails and an in installation of new lighting and bollards. Um, safety is a big one for us too on this bridge, having a lot of students utilize this corridor uh, for school. And uh, we wanna make sure that we have adequate lighting moving forward. And just running into a little bit about project criteria and, and something, you know, how do these projects come to the top of the list? And um, here's some questions that we ask ourselves, whether or not this is a demographic need uh, with the census tract surrounding the project using a state tool. Um, I can go into more detail of what that state tool is and the areas that we look at, but this does meet that um, demographic need. Uh, whether or not the pro uh, proposed project is located within a delineated social and environmentally equity zone as we map in our current park and natural uh, lands master plan, which this project does as well. And then whether or not the condition rating of this park or facility requires investment. Our structural, structural and bridge engineers call this bridge a critical need. So this is at the highest level. And then it, we also rate it internally, um, five being the worst and then one being the best. The reason why it's rated at a four because the bridge is currently open. Um, if it was rated a five, that would be an asset that would be currently closed to the public. And then whether or not the community desires uh, this proposed improvement. Uh, we learned a lot through the survey process as well of where we're going and heading with our 2021 master plan and uh, using walking and hiking trails, number two on the uh, list community-wide of 
of, and, and just below the enjoying nature, using our trail system is number two priority within the public. Adding and improving um, path, uh, pathways, number five. And then 96% of the survey results of the 4,000 complete surveys that we received um, use our system with walking and hiking trails in our Centennial Trail Network. And then lastly, too, what we look at is whether or not this park community has received historical park investment. Um, this has not um, seen any uh, since it was constructed. And then we even dive down a little bit further of even within District 1, which has historically been underfunded, um, has only seen about 9% of major park capital allocation since 1999. And so this would be a high need for that area. And for us, when we look at equity, I think the biggest risk that we have until some of these bridges are structurally repaired or replaced, Parks and Recreation will not be able to utilize, unless there's outside funding like ARP or otherwise grants, use our park capital resources for other park capital assets um, because this would consume 100% of our park capital to take on some of these long-term structural needs. So with that, I will um, answer any questions that council has. All right, I saw council member Cathcart and then council member Kinnear also wanted to note council member Zappone's with us. So council member Cathcart. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Uh, first off, 9%, holy smokes. Uh, that's That should be pretty striking for all of us, I think, seeing that number. Uh, second, I guess, I mean, this makes sense. It's a liability. We have to address it. I guess my, my question is, how long in your mind before this goes from a four to a five and it is just shut down if we don't address it? And then um, where was the original or where were the funds planned to come from originally when we had applied for this grant? Great question. Um, I, I could tell you what becomes of between a four and a five, and I would say portions of this bridge are already a five because they are shut down to the public um, with the existing overlooks that we have. It can happen in a matter of, I'll be honest, the next bridge inspection. That happened to our North Suspension Bridge where one day it was opened and then the next day I had to close it for two years. Um, and then when we look at where the other match was coming from was a combination of our park capital in a two year span and not knowing what potential relief, and as you know, we, we try to contain our park budget is, is internally as much as we can and look at the long-term sustainability. Um, in that 2020 timeframe, all park capital was, was suspended other than those um, secured dollars that we had outside of our operating fund, which was at the time, you know, the redevelopment bond and some other grant projects. Now we're just stacked up against this deadline because of that deferral, um, trying to do our fiscally responsible, um, if, you know, at the time we didn't know that the ARP funding was gonna be available or anything like this for the relief. So we wanted to make sure that without any relief, we still could maintain the critical operations of the department. And to do that, we had to defer capital for about 18 months. Okay, thank you. Council member Kinnear. Yeah. Thanks. I can remember this conversation about Don Cardon Ridge when I was on the board of Friends of Centennial Trail, and that was, I think, seven years ago. So there, it was an issue back then. It's not gotten any better. I'm wondering if, to save time, to save money, if we could use a design build um, template or whatever to get this done quicker. Is that an option? So we just hire one contractor, does the design, does the build. We don't have to go out for a second bid, just get it done. Great question, Laurie. I think, you know, at, at this point, we would have to go to get state approval through the PRC program to uh, qualify this as a design build. Um, we feel comfortable enough right now um, that it is fully designed and the big docks are complete. Uh, we really just need to send a you know, hit the send button to get this out onto the street. Um, and, and one advantage that we have 
doing this now as well, is a lot of this material, precast concrete and other material, can be fabricated off-site and then brought onto the bridge. And so a lot of that, we can secure that pricing now, in, and they can get it built now, so then we don't see the, I mean, we all have seen the, um, the inconsistencies in, uh, in the pricing right now, especially around steel, concrete, structural components. Um, but at this point, I think to get state approval for the design build prop process would actually delay us because we are at a point now where the design and specs are 100% complete. We fully funded all of that within parks and some other outside funding, so we're just ready to ready hit the go button. So it's shovel ready. And so is there a, going to be a 10% contingency as well as the, as you showed the budget, I didn't see a contingency at all for that. That is built into the total cost. That's okay. standard for 10%. Okay. You didn't. Okay. Yep. Sorry. Yep. Right. Thanks. Should have mentioned that. And just to follow up on the historical investment, uh, it would be fair to say that the the bulk of capital investment in recent years has been Riverfront Park and that very little of that is in District 1. Is that one reason why those numbers are so skewed or is it – or is that – Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the bulk of parks capital historically is – is our, our mechanism to utilize is, is bonding. And so we had one in 1999 for about $14.5 million that was um, – you know, spread out community wide, but didn't really hit a lot. A lot of that was used for Lower Manitou and the parking lot and the roundabout area, and um, and then in 2008, um, it was aquatics and sports fields. So Dwight Merkel, our six aquatic centers, and then our youth baseball, uh, softball fields, and then splash pads, um, and that was pretty well dispersed. But yeah, it does you that quite a bit with Riverfront Park because that is our largest bond. You know, we went from about 17 million now to 64.3 in, in 2014. So that does skew the number because all of that investment that is a part of this equation went into our downtown core. Yep. Yep. Okay. Other questions? Councilmember Wilkerson. Thank you. And, and thank you, Garrett, um, for the great overview. I'm just asking this of everyone because I'm wondering if people are really digging deeper. If there were no ARPA funds, what would happen? Which is the same question I was going to ask the fire uh, to make us think a little bit differently instead of just, I'm not calling it the easy way out, but we are not looking to be as possibly resourceful as we could be just because this little pocket of savings is over to the side. So what the, you know, if we didn't have this um, amount of cash, what I would, um, you know, recommend to our staff is evaluate the risk of losing the grant money and then evaluating the risk of whether or not we put all our eggs into one basket and continue to defer the projects that we did have planned system-wide. And then do we want to put all those eggs into the bridge basket and then just continuing to defer the capital projects. And so I think our strategy in Parks and Recreation is then how do we look at these one-time shovel-ready projects that then, so we're, so that puts us in a position to whether we're not reacting anymore from the, from the pandemic. Now we can be proactive in, 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 you know, in 2022 and 2023. So then how do we look at those several years of deferral and then stop that and then we can actually move forward in a positive way. It would just continue, I guess, Betsy, we just continued that deferral process for all these other projects going on. Can I follow up? So was that analysis done, what you would just describe with your team? Um, if we don't do this, we will do that. Was that done with some type of metric, whether you, we lose this, current grant funding or not, I'm, I'm just asking, did we think it all the way through um, no. the, the pro and cons of this? We did. Um, we did. And, and I, you know, the, at the conclusion of this, too, is 
the biggest pro for us of using this one-time ARP funds is one one point four million dollars is a lot of money. Um, historically, our park capital budget is only a million dollars a year. So regardless, we would have to look outside. So one hundred percent of our capital fund could not fund this remaining amount. Um, so we'd have to look at the other operational uh, efficiencies or savings to look to make this bridge project move forward. And then two, looking at trying to utilize what capital we do have and continue to build on our community investments and priorities and commitments that we've already made at a community level. When we talk about $100,000 projects here and there, huge impacts from a neighborhood level but we're just not able to do that when we have this bridge risk sitting out there. Councilmember Bingle. Thank you. Uh, I have a few questions for you, if that's okay. Um, so what happens to the Centennial Trail if we say no to taking money from ARP funds um, and funding this? We would have to go back to the drawing board and, you know, worst case scenario, um, similar to a couple other bridges that we've had to do is, is look at um, the contingency. If this was bridge needed to be closed, what would that alternative route look like? And do you have any ideas as to what that alternative route would look like, or is that something you haven't addressed yet? Um, we've looked at it from a standpoint of detouring around when we have construction. So when, when this is offline, we've worked with our stakeholders, the Friends of the Centennial Trail and both universities in the neighborhood and of, of using uh, the Spokane Falls uh, Boulevard Bridge. Um, so going into Gonzaga and then utilizing uh, that, that bridge that crosses, the vehicular bridge that crosses the river into the WSU Eastern Campus. Um, so that would be the most efficient and shortest detour that we'd be able to utilize. Uh, speaking of the universities in the, in the area, have we approached any of the universities to see if they would potentially fund it and then we name it the Gonzaga Bridge or the WSU Bridge or the UW you know, Bridge? Have we done that? We have. Um, we've had numerous meetings with their um, leadership um, there, there is some small amount of, of opportunity that has been of interest, um, but they have been hesitant to really say yes or no if the, the majority of the commitment of the funding isn't there for the bridge. Uh, for, for example, uh, there's been interest to say, you know, it could be X, Y, and Z overlook. Right, so it's not really the whole bridge, but it's maybe smaller components. Um, so there's still that opportunity there. And so this is, I would say, you know, if I was to write a resolution or something, it would be, this is the, the worst case scenario amount. And if we were able to get that commitment and then other potential dollars would come in, we would make sure that we're transparent with that. And whatever that dollar amount is, you know, we could return it or we could look at reinvesting into other pro uh, projects and working with the council. Mm -hmm. So if, uh, you know, is there at, in your conversations of being able to say, hey, you know, we'd be willing to match this much if the city came up with, you know, $700,000, we'd match the other $700,000. If you had a, a smaller commitment from the city, you, you think that you could get uh, some money from the universities to be, to be on board and help with the project? Yeah, but I would say the dollar amounts that we're we're talking with are about ten to twenty thousand dollar pieces. So you know, if there was that, it would, you know, it would be helping with with some of the overlooked components or some of the amenities, right? So benches and other some of those the icing on the cake type of uh, amenities. No, like six figure amount. No, like no. six figure amount. Okay. No. Uh, my last question. Sorry, I know I'm taking a lot of time here. Um, when you say that this is an area of equity focus, is that because it's in District 1, or is that uh, just because this specific spot in District 1 is an area of equity focus? We use a tool and a map, and I, I can go into a little bit of the details. So we look of when it falls into certain zones. So it does fall in with that um, 
level of service zone, which includes more of District 1. So we look at medium uh, household income. So in this area, it's average of 22.6 thousand compared to the state average of 66. Um, percentage of people of color, percentage of people with disabilities, the BMI index, uh, and the mortality rate. So that is the demographic piece of the state tool that we use. And then we overlay a social and environmental equity zone through our master planning process. And we use a lot of um, data from the CDC in places. So it's a population level analysis and community mm -hmm. estimate. And so that includes, you know, is there asthma? What is the mental health? What is the physical mm -hmm. health? Um, you know, the trans I guess, question, I guess my question along with that is, do you think this investment through an equity lens is helping to serve that population or is it just serving the population of the city and not addressing that population that, uh, that we're saying we're addressing? I'd say it's twofold. Um, I would say yes. And then also the bigger impact is the equity issue around future liability as well. So future investment, we take away this risk, then we're able to utilize future investments again through the lens of these equity and demographic um, um, pieces that we're able to use our own dollars then to invest into those park improvements. Mm -hmm. So you think that this would help to elevate the population of the, of the Logan neighborhood? I'm sorry, I didn't get it. So you think this would help to elevate the population of the, of the Logan neighborhood there? I do. I think, you know, even present and then future opportunities giving up, you know, giving us the city more flexibility in the future to respond. Thank you very much. I, Garrett, I just had a quick question about that equity tool. Um, how, so we've got the bridge and we can put a pin right on the bridge and it's in the middle of a park. Nobody lives there. So how, how wide is your uh, circle outwards into what the economic circumstances of the people are, if, if you know. I'm just trying to get a sense. Is it the whole district or is it, you know, half a mile or what, what, what's your sense of that? I would have to look, sorry, Councilor, exactly on the census track. That state tool is all determined around that census track. Okay. And I'd have to get you the, the okay. exact distance on whatever that census track is that the bridge that, falls within. That'd be great. And it's helpful. It's, it's one, I'm super excited that you have that tool and I think some of us, when we saw the word equity and we kind of thought of that location, it kind of clanged on our brains a little bit. And so you explained a little better, but it will be helpful to know how wide that circle is. And then I also got the other piece that you explained, which was if you use all your capital budget monies for the next two years on this, then you don't have it to go into other low income census tracts to, to upgrade parks and things like that. So I understood that. Correct. Um, all right. Well, thanks for uh, walking the gauntlet today. We appreciate it. And uh, um, no problem. Is there? Um, could I ask if there's any next steps that you'd like from me or? Um, well, yes. So, well, I don't. I'm just about to straw poll the people who are on the on the call today from council. Uh, kind of similar to. Um, um, the fire trucks, uh, I think the Parks Department needs a resolution from us of whether we favor funding um, the, the ask, the $1,450,000 one ask of additional funds for the Cardong Bridge uh, is, is one piece. I haven't heard too much pushback on that, but the question is, should it be ARP funding or not? So I guess I'm looking for people's thoughts on whether or not uh, this is a ARP type of projects or people are wanting to uh, not use ARP on this. So I'm um, looking for that. So Council Member Cathcart. Yeah, I would just say, I think very similar to the last one, it's, it's obviously an important need and it is a liability. Um, and we don't want to lose this asset or have it just sit Mothball because you know we don't want to fix it. I guess my challenge on the ARP side, and it's kind of similar to my my thinking with regard to the fire trucks, is um, it's you don't know what you don't know, 
and without sort of seeing all of the other proposals and everything else that's going to come forward and some of those discussions, it's hard to balance and prioritize competing interests within ARP. Um, so certainly I'm open to it. Uh, it's just hard to say without a shadow of a doubt that this is certainly a higher priority than something else without kind of going through that, that process. But, um, but certainly I'm very open to it, and it is a liability that I think we do have to address. So. Council Member Kinnear. I, I equate this, and I've said to this to some of you before, with, you know, you're on the airplane and they say, in case of emergency, put on your own oxygen mask first. And I equate this the same way. We have an obligation to make our departments in the city whole because we serve the citizens of Spokane. And we know that parks have been decimated by COVID and all the related issues that go with COVID and have lost a tremendous amount of dollars because of COVID. And I think this is different than fire in that it is one of those departments that it, the citizens depend on. And we have that obligation to make sure that our departments are whole. So I would say that this is a good um, topic, a good subject for ARPA funding and in the grand scheme of $80 million, it is, is not a huge amount of money, but it's going to do a tremendous amount for parks and ultimately in the future, uh, put parks back on a trajectory to serving all the citizens and getting back on track with, with actual um, programs that are going to create dollars for them in the future. Okay. All right, I think Council Member Bingle and then Wilkerson. Yeah, no, I love the Centennial Trail. I think it's it's great to have this replaced. Again, I think just I like clear definitions. I like money is being used for what it should be used for. And so for me, I think that getting the trail done and, and back to, uh, you know, 100% operation is, is a great idea. For me, I don't like the idea of using it through an equity lens because I don't see how this is best serving the underserved populations um, of the city. I think that if, you know, we did lose $1.6 million in revenue, then putting it through the lens of lost revenue is, is a much better way uh, to, uh, uh, to address this. And I, I look forward to seeing how we uh, uh, calculated that $1.6 million in, uh, in lost revenue. Council Member Wilkerson. Thank you. Not that I'm not supportive of parks, I am. I know the bridge is a need. Uh, what's becoming challenging is these emergency requests that others in the community don't have the ability to bring forward because there are a lot of entities that potentially might lose funding for whatever they have going on also. So how do we make that equitable? In the city, yes, we want to make the city whole, but it's like we are meeting the needs of the city, which are critical, but what about the community? So I'm looking forward to us giving the same consideration if something comes from the community that is an emergency um, that's been presented to us today from fire and parks, that we give it the same consideration and thoughtful process that's happened today on these two entities. All right. Um, Council members of Pone, do you have, I've, if you have anything that you don't, you don't need to, but I just want to make sure you have a chance to say anything. Um, no, I, I'm still mulling over, and okay. Okay. I'm in definitely supportive. I, I use that bridge a lot during the pandemic, so I know how important it is. Yeah. The resource generation. Yeah. Yeah, and I'll just again, I, uh, I, I support the bridge replacement. I, I support it using ARP funds, um, as Councilmember Kinnear mentioned. Um, Parks took a very big hit from the COVID pandemic, and also people are utilizing parks more as a response, and particularly this is a connectivity thing. The more people who are walking uh, and biking then, and don't have to use um, public transit um, and also can just be healthy and, and out there, I think uh, fits within the ARP, either as revenue replacement or an actual um, pandemic um, mitigation response. So um, I am 
we haven't heard from Council Member Stratton because she's not here today, but uh, Garrett, and far, as far as next steps, I would um, uh, put a resolution together that, um, sa that says the city's committed to funding the bridge replacement, and then we'll talk more perhaps on Monday. I don't, the, with fire, we had a deadline of the 14th. I guess my question for you is when's the last date as far as meeting your construction schedule that we could put in the, res uh, approve the resolution. If we, if we need to do it on the 10th, we can do it on the 10th, but uh, it sounds like this may take a little more debate than that. The 17th is a holiday, so it's, I guess, the 10th or the 24th, and my question for you is uh, the 24th uh, workable still? If we approved it on the 24th, does that still give you time to put it out for bid? I think the 21st or the 24th would work um, okay. just fine, Council President. Okay. I think, um, you know, at the end of the day, it's when we get to the um, any type of contract that we have to have the, the funds encumbered right. there to be able to enter into any contract. And if I could just mention a question too for Councilman Bingle, when you look at, um, you know, it's not necessarily we're trying to swing this from an equity standpoint. I, we're just showing this is the, the lens and, and data and, and that we use on every single project in, in parks and recreation um, from an equity standpoint. Um, on the revenue uh, replenishment side, when we look at net revenues, how our, our system is set up is 70% of our funding comes from general fund allocations of the 8%, 30% become through program revenues. And so essentially 30% of that was shut down during the pandemic. Those are programs that we weren't able to achieve. Now, and that, that was about a little bit north of $7 million of revenue that we lost. But then when you look at the programs, you have expenses, of course, with those programs and those revenues coming in. So when you look at the net, that net loss bottom line is that $1.6 million. Thank, thanks for addressing that, Garrett. And it sounds like uh, you could work with Councilmember Kinnear and myself on a on a resolution, and we could we could al almost do it on regular order with that much time to do it since we don't have to. Okay. Do so we don't. I have will to, plan for We don't have to file it this week. We can file it next week. Yeah. Um, okay. Great. Thank you, Garrett. Um, and then we have on our the last thing. I don't think this will take too long, but again, just since we're always trying to follow our council rules of having a touch at either a study session or a committee, we have the resolution that appoints uh, all of us to various boards and commissions and work groups, and it has an attachment with that. We, as you all know, we had a kind of survey that went out to people. I put together a first draft, and then I got feedback before Christmas from people uh, and so we made an adjustment based on that feedback and this is it's set for a vote on Monday which is the second meeting of the year which is when we always do it um, but if anyone has any more comments or concerns now is the time so but, all right not seeing any Really appreciate everyone's interest in everything, and uh, it's quite a puzzle to try to uh, put all the Hi, various factors. Uh, Council Member one, Kinnear. I have one comment. Yeah. Sorry. Just reminding everybody, the, especially for the new people, and I know I've said this already, but it bears repeating that the committees and commissions you're assigned to, for some of them, uh, you have a three, three misses, three strikes you're out, essentially. So be aware of the rules around those boards and commissions, and also be aware that um, some of them are very time consuming because you have your original board, and then you have all these subcommittees you're required to attend as well. So it, it looks, you know, I, I look at mine, I go, yeah, I have 11 boards and commissions I'm assigned to, and then they're all the subcommittees. So it's death by meetings, death by thousand cuts, and just, just be aware that when you get into this, it's, it's, it's gonna seem overwhelming 
um, and it's going to take some getting used to, and there's a lot of reading because every single one of them has, especially if you're on SRTC, a lot of information that is going to, and a lot of money that you're going to be responsible for. So um, just putting that out there, not to scare you, but just to prepare you. Thanks. Also, just wanted to follow up and channel Councilmember Mum. Uh, we started to do this last year. We, we didn't do it very well, but that was that when there's something that's significant that happens at any of these meetings, we're looking for a quick all council member staff email that says that. And, um, uh, you know, Councilmember Cathcart chairs the police pension board and I don't think our meeting this week had anything like that that was earth shattering uh, so it's not like every meeting we need the minutes for it but um, uh, in the past I know I've been at regional leadership meeting with the county about homelessness and uh, neglected to tell people a conversation that's going on and so just a reminder to people when something uh, interesting happens just shoot us all an email that says hey this is kind of going on and we can all be in the loop uh, on it so uh, we'll, we'll continue to remind people about that. Um, and then the last thing I was just going to mention is that it's already time to start getting ready for our first quarter uh, council retreat. So Hannah Lee is working on dates for that. And we're going to talk about how we're going to organize our committees and work plans for um, our uh, leadership team staff at the council and hopefully uh, various council members talking about their priorities for the year. So that's all to come, but this is just a, a verbal prompt that you'll get something in writing about that. Um, so uh, with that, I really appreciate everyone's time and engagement today. And uh, we'll see you all Monday. We have double committee meeting Monday since we had no committee this last. So can someone tell me when exactly public safety starts? 10 a.m., Sharp, not 10.15, not 10.30, 10 a.m. All right, we'll be at public safety 10 a.m. Monday. We'll see you then. Uh, take care. We're adjourned.